And I'll just real quick introduce you guys to uh, Josh and Karen, who probably don't need much of an introduction with this audience. Karen Kasiba is the managing director of the Farm or Flexible Array of Radars and Mesonets Facility and research scientist at the University of Alabama Huntsville. She has a BS in physics from Loyola University, an MS in physics, and an MAT in teacher education from Miami University, and a PhD in atmospheric science from Purdue. Her research mainly focuses on the kinematics and dynamics of severe convective storms, characterizing the low-level wind structure in tornadoes and understanding the boundary layer winds and small-scale structures in landfalling hurricanes. Key to her research is executing field projects to collect data that can be analyzed to better understand and predict these hazardous weather events. Additionally, she's passionate about science education, regularly participating in outreach activities at school, schools, museums, and festivals, and online and through media interviews and consultations. A strong believer in experiencing weather from the inside of a mobile weather radar like today, She's participated as a radar operator, project scientist, and project leader in a multitude of field projects, including those studying tornadoes, hurricanes, snow, convective initiation fires, and nocturnal convection. Dr. Josh Warman is an atmospheric scientist and inventor of the Doppler on Wheels, a mobile radar system designed to get close to some of the most dangerous weather on Earth in order to obtain high-resolution, detailed data that has revolutionized our understanding of tornadoes, hurricanes, wildfires, and blizzards. He founded the nonprofit Center for Severe Weather Research, and he's led multiple large multi-agency deployments to study severe weather, including serving as PI of the Vortex 2 project, the largest tornado research project in history. He now serves as the executive director of the Flexible Array of Radars and Mesonets facility in partnership with the University of Alabama Huntsville, which comprises multiple DALs and other types of mobile radars, mobile mesonets, and deployable tornado and hurricane pods and other sensor equipment. Dr. Warman's research includes tornado climatology, the process of tornado genesis, hurricane behavior, and bi-static radar. Prior to uh, the Center for Severe Weather Research, he was an affiliate scientist at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, working in on bi-static radar and an associate professor of meteorology at the University of Oklahoma. He has a BS in physics and interdisciplinary science, an MS in meteorology, and an SCD in meteorology, all from MIT. So thank you everyone today for joining us for this breaking news topic. Um, we are uh, talking about Hurricane Helen, uh, which was just recently uh, designated a dangerous Cat 3. I'm going to oh. hand it over now to oh. Josh and Karen to discuss their work on hurricanes and their goals for the mission that they're currently on on this hurricane. And then we will open up the floor to questions. So please, just a reminder, if you have questions, please submit your questions through the Q&A option in the Zoom program. We are not gonna be monitoring the chat function. And now I will hand it over to Josh and Karen. So I've got to share my screen. Okay, I didn't know if it was Now you get to see person. Josh's face up real close. <laughs> well, yeah. It's a special feature of this webinar <laughs> and being in a DAO. <laughs> it's cozy in here. Hot, noisy, and cozy. I think you might have to back up a few slides there. Yeah, maybe I'm at the end of the thing. So, hold on. Okay, there we are. Now I'll share again. This, that, and then go to presenter tomorrow. All right. There we go. Okay. Um, Just, yep, so, beautiful. Oh, yeah, so as Jen said, we are currently uh, awaiting the arrival of Hurricane Helene. Uh, we're sitting in Perry, Florida um, at an airstrip. And uh, we have both DAOs here. We're waiting another hour or two to decide whether to do one last minute job. Um, to adjust position because we're trying to have the eye pass directly over us and it's a little unclear exactly where the eye is going to go. 
five, 10 mile errors make a difference to us. So we really need to wait and wait and catch that last wiggle or wobble so we can get directly in the path. Um, but uh, Karen and I made a very short presentation that just uh, describes why we're doing what we're doing here. Um, and then afterwards, we can talk about that in general or about what we're doing in particular. Um, so our biggest questions we're trying to answer um, are not so much about where is the hurricane going to go or distant forecasting. That's uh, that's a problem that's related to these hurricane models that are seeing what it's going to do from 300 miles offshore to here. Uh, we're looking at these hurricanes as they make landfall. And what are the winds really like? Um, there's not a lot of information about that because um, it's just hard to get measurements here. A lot of weather stations go down. Uh, it's a pretty small phenomenon, and it goes between the weather service uh, stations. Um, and also, how exactly do they do damage? Why are some areas damaged much more uh, than others? Uh, just in this illustration here, why did that house survive and the others got wiped out? Was it a difference in wind? Was it a difference in how well it was built? Why, you know, why do some houses survive and some don't? Um, so we deployed in 18 hurricanes, 19 now, including this one, um, mostly along the Gulf Coast, um, but also along uh, the Florida, North Carolina coasts. Uh, so far, not North Carolina or Georgia, South Carolina or Georgia. Um, but uh, basically, we go wherever uh, the hurricane's making landfall. We leave from Colorado. We drive down to the coast. We try to find favorable spots to park. Uh, the picture on the top left, I think, is perhaps Karen's first hurricane. Uh, we were deployed right on a cliff at the edge of the intercoastal highway. Um, so that was kind of interesting because the cliff started eroding away a little bit under one of those feet. So it was a good introduction for Karen, but she uh, she kept coming back. Um, and you see there's other pictures of us in, in different storms. Um, we deploy uh, three major types of instrumentation. One is DAOs. Uh, and depending on what other repairs, what other projects we're doing, literally how much money we have, we deploy one, two, or three DAOs. Uh, we deploy an array of pods on the bottom left. You see a picture of us deploying pods. Um, in fact, two of the people who are here, that's that's Josh Worman, me, and Josh Akins, uh, who's also down here, deploying in a, in a hurricane on top, and we're deploying this pod on top of a levee. It's just a rugged weather station uh, that we can put in some really forward locations where we kind of be scared to put it down. Um, our latest uh, addition to our instruments is something called Polenet, um, and that is shown on the right there, where basically we have uh, a weather station just attached to a pole and it's cantilevered out. And the idea is to get it up higher uh, than these pods, which are only about one meter off the ground. Um, and we just deploy one of those um, over near uh, Oplochini Oak Bay, um, close to where the center might make landfall. It's either going to make landfall over there or over here, we think. So. What we're looking at um, are features in the hurricane boundary layer, the lowest kilometer of the atmosphere. And there are different types of structures in the lowest parts of hurricanes. One on the top right, um, you probably see sometimes in the hurricane center, we'll talk about it, or you'll see it in the weather service radars, are these big uh, cyclones that are inside the eye of the hurricane. They're sort of like multiple vortices in a tornado or like low pressure systems, Rossby waves in the, in the jet stream. And they spin around the hurricane, and there's stronger winds than when one of those crosses over you. Um, a second phenomenon we see, uh, which we discovered with the Dows, um, are boundary layer rolls, or boundary layer streaks. Um, and on the left there, you just see a collage of boundary layer streaks in 15 different hurricanes. Um, they're always there. Interestingly, no one knew they were there until we took a Dow inside of its first hurricane. And then we saw these streaks, and now people are going through ADAT data, and you can see the streaks, but nobody ever saw them before because they were just, they're pretty small and it's, they're difficult to see. There are also some other types of phenomenon inside the hurricane eye walls, which we see sometimes, but not in all hurricanes. And on the right there, you see an image of what's called a tornado scale vortex. These are very small, um, less than half a mile across, um, and they seemed, in Harvey at least, to be associated with greatly enhanced damage uh, that happened in that eye wall. Um, so, and that's a new discovery also that there are these streaks and we mapped them out, showed how fast they were moving, et cetera. So here's a animation and hopefully this comes through on whatever internet we have here out in the field um, of what these boundary layer streaks look like. Um, in a hurricane, basically it's really windy and rainy for hours and hours and hours. And it could be boring, except that there are these smaller scale streaks going through. Sometimes there's these tornado scale vortices. There's other little features going on. This shows on the blue side winds that are coming towards the radar. And in the red, the winds are moving away. 
but you can see there are these kind of linear streaks um, of darker blue and, and red, um, dark blue coming towards us and red going away from us that show where the strongest winds are. It's not just a constant wind. It's gusty, but it's organized into these linear streaks. Um, here's a picture uh, or a, an old video of us deployed near a building that was in the process of falling down. You can see the roof is failing. It's lifting up the uh, supports and uh, it's going through a process where these streaks are passing over it. Um, and then eventually, I'll show you in a second, a strong one passes over and just knocks the whole thing down. But it's this process of progressive failure at this roof. We were smart, by the way, and we did park upstream of this uh, very weak structure. So we certainly weren't down downstream of it when it fell down. Um, what's interesting for us scientifically, I mean, that's a cool looking video, but for science, we, we have radar data and we, sh we can see which wind gust knocked it down. And those, that blue splotch on the top row is this wind gust. It's part of one of these streaks that's moving towards the radar and crosses us right about the time the building drops uh, falls down. And we also had a pod in the parking lot right next to us. So uh, we could see the wind measurements when that building fell down. So we can learn something about how the hurricanes are doing damage. Here's a loop of those mesoscale vortices, those large scale vortices that are spinning around uh, by hurricane. This is inside Hurricane Harvey. So we're inside the eye and we're watching the eye wall spin around us. And if you look on the right side, you can see it's kind of cusped and curled around. There's almost like books um, there. And they're associated with differences in the Doppler, uh, which is on the left, but there's blue and white areas, blue and yellow areas right next to each other where there's rotation going on. This is essentially a multiple vortex hurricane because of these meso vortices spinning around it. Lastly, here's a very quick image showing you what the tornado scale vortices look like. Um, on the left, you can see the Doppler, and it's a little hard to see, and if we have some more time and questions, we can talk more about it, but there are little couplets there, which we commonly see in tornadoes, which are moving very, very fast around the uh, hurricane high. They're not that, the spinning in them isn't that strong, but still, on the strong side of those, it's maybe 20 miles an hour faster, and if you're already embedded in a 120 mile an hour wind, 20 extra miles an hour means it's 140, and that really can be a threshold for doing a lot of damage. And I think we switch. I do this one. Well, so I'll let Karen talk. I've been talking for a while. Why are these all interesting? Yeah. I'm studying this stuff. Um, so as Josh said, um, a lot of these streaks or these rolls, um, there's sort of two scales of stuff present there. Um, they're really ubiquitous in the hurricane back on the east side. You see them Dow data, but also carefully close enough to the ADAT as well. Um, and like I said, there's a few scales present, um, larger scales, uh, one kilometer or so that people document that go almost uh, through the entire depth of the boundary layer, um, one kilometer, and then these sub-kilometer scale rolls. It's really the ones that we're looking at because we think that they have a lot of energy on me. Um, so the really important thing about these is that they can be carrying energy. They can be mixing energy in the hurricane boundary layer. So mixing up with this warm ocean Mixing the boundary layer, but also mixing down momentum higher up, the higher winds down to the surface. So we think there's a lot of mixing going on with these roll type structures. Um, I always put a note in if you model on the phone call. Um, <laughs> you should be looking at our data um, because this is seen in a lot of different model studies. Um, it's not very well represented in numerical forecasting models. Um, also, these could be associated with very localized swaths of advanced winds. Um, some of these streaks, um, if they're strong enough, Josh showed that both are being knocked down. This is persistent streak of strong, strong winds. Um, but these tornado scale vortices, you can have a swath of these mesoscale vortices, um, really enhance the background wind and can be really associated with very strong winds of winds and damage. Uh, um, so just real quick, quick science -y. Um, So one of the cool things that we did, Josh said, we first hurricane deployment at Francis, um, it was a dual Doppler, so we had two radars looking at these uh, fine scale structures. Um, and we're able to kind of look at the three dimensional wind fields, get the horizontal winds, but then be able to drive the up and downs. Um, we did indeed confirm that these, um, these sort of mid scale vortices do have an up and down structure associated with them. Um, this was really uh, confirmed the first time with this. Um, also, you could look at stuff, we look at stuff like turbulent kinetic energy and mixing. Um, and if you just you know, look on average, um, sure, it's happening um, over a large area. But if you look at particular locations where these streaks are occurring, you see much larger turbulent kinetic energy. Yeah, this is very important for your forecast intensity model. 
Um, and then just a quick example of a hurricane deployment, um, Hurricane Laura back in uh, 20, 20, 2020, like, what do you do? Um, so uh, this one, um, unfortunately, uh, I was a big chicken. Um, so we backed up to I-10 here and we did a couple Doppler deployment um, away from the coast. Um, but you can get a kind of scale here of what we're looking at. So you see, that's when the EDAT right before it fails. Um, you see the big eye wall um, wrapping around, but then you see our two radars there, those two dots. Um, and you see those small little lobes there. That's our study area. Those are the types of scales that we're looking at. Um, so with this play, Well, if it doesn't play, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, anyway, real quick, um, basically, again, just showing you, we're looking at really small scale stuff. It's okay. I'm trying to make a play. That's fine. Don't worry about it. Um, and just, again, trying to quantify the size of these. Um, size of these, we think matter. We think that different energies contained at different scales. Really trying to understand what scales are present in different hurricanes, how those are responsible for transporting this momentum. Um, and then just an example of what a dual Doppler analysis looks like. Um, you saw those uh, neat little loops that Josh showed with the raw data. Um, you can see that once you do these vector wind retrievals, you can see the vector winds there, um, the, the colored contours there, those are the speed. You see those streaks um, still being resolved by dual Doppler analysis, which is great because that means we can look at the kinematics of what's going on these, not just look at the single Doppler. Uh, that's, that's it. it. <laughs> this place, maybe. Oh, yeah. Uh, this is what it looks like when the hurricanes, uh, when we're deployed in front of a hurricane. <laughs> so it is windy and rainy uh, for a long time. So we had hours of this in, I think this might have been Hurricane Delta. All right, this goes on for hours, so we could stop that. I can stop it, right? Okay. Oh. Stop share. Sure. <laughs> Okay, that's what we got. So that's our ten minutes yeah. introduction of what yeah. we do and yeah. what kind of data we're trying to collect and what yeah. kind of science questions we're trying to answer. And again, just uh, repeating again, we're we're here in front of Hurricane Helene right now. We're watching it just like everybody is. Every uh, every radar update, every model update, we're watching to see. Uh, but for us, it's really important uh, because we're going to be making tactical decisions based on some of those wiggles and wobbles about whether to stay here at the airport or go about 30 miles west um, to a better location. Uh, right now, we're probably gonna stay, uh, but one of the things we do is we try to stay very nimble and don't make permanent commitments of where we're gonna deploy our radars until the last possible uh, moment. For us, that last moment is gonna be when it gets so windy that we can't get down the road to the other site because big branches and stuff are gonna start falling down. And that starts happening when it gets to be about 50 miles an hour, maybe 70 miles an hour. Uh, over that road. That actually leads me into our first question. Um, and a reminder, folks, if you just joined us, we're taking questions uh, through the Q&A function on your, in your Zoom screen, should be at the bottom of your menu, um, which, which was, what is your general location and how is that relative to the location of pods and full net if you're using them? And why did you choose those locations? Like what is sort of the strategy behind those decisions? So intercepting a hurricane, it, it, in some ways it's like any chase, you're balancing different factors. I mean, let's say you're chasing a tornado. You wanna get up close and see the tornado and have it look really cool, but you also don't wanna die. So very similar to what we have here. Uh, what we want to do is get very uh, ambitious data. We're really trying to get the best groundbreaking data. Um, we get that better in the strongest winds we can. We want to be in the right front eye and eye wall. Uh, we want to be as close to the coast as we can so we can see these streaks as they're over the ocean and then crossing onto land. Um, on the other hand, we can't be on a beach in the right front eye wall or in a swamp in the right front eye wall because we'll go underwater in the surge. It's going to be 15, 20 feet in some locations. Um, in this storm. So uh, it turns out this area, the Big Bend in Florida is very swampy. There's just not much near the coast um, and there aren't many clear out, cleared out hills near the coast. So it's very difficult to find places to park the trucks. Uh, so right now we are at an airport in Perry. It's probably 20 some feet above sea level. We're not going under in surge. So 
completely safe, but we're farther from the coast than we wish we were. Um, so there's a compromise there. We have a site to the west of here that's on a bridge, um, which looks like it's going to be above the surge. The bridge is about 20 some feet above um, the ocean surface, so it'll stay above the surge even if there's a 15 foot surge. Um, but there's waves on top of that surge, and there's also a lot of extra wind when you're high up on a bridge. So if it's going to be cat four and that's going to be on the strong side of the eye, we're pretty leery about being there. On the other hand, if it's cat three and maybe going to be central or even on the weak side of the eye, we might zip over there um, because we can tolerate that site from a safety perspective. Um, you asked about pods. We haven't deployed the pods yet. We're waiting to decide whether we move and then we're going to rush the pods out once we know where we're going to move the radars. Uh, we did deploy one pole. Um, and I think we've shared some, an image from that of setting that up. We deployed one pole um, in that Western location um, where we might put it down. And we were just, we were time limited for that. Time was running out to deploy that pod, in fact, uh, that pole. In fact, the water was already six inches or a foot over the road as we were deploying it. And as you might be able to see in the picture, our ladder, our, our feet are in the water as we're deploying this, this pole already. Um, because the storm surge was starting to happen in that region. Probably there's going to be 10 feet or more of storm surge. So we had to de deploy it and get out of there so we weren't stranded ourselves. Related note, how in situations like this, there's a lot of safety stuff that you all are mitigating. Um, a lot of things that are out of your control. Um, how do you keep the DAOs and yourselves safe when you deploy on missions like this one? <laughs> um, well, I think Josh was talking about uh, some of that. I mean, so we certainly, we go and we evaluate um, places that, you know, are above surge level um, and places that we think are going to get inundated with surge. Um, we're looking at the storm path. We're looking at where we might be in relation to the storm path, how confident we are in the storm path. So whether we will be on that east or west side, um, that makes a big difference. Um, I'm if we decide that that's a good location for the deploy. Um, I've shown Laura quickly um, up there, and Laura, we played, we played pretty well inland, about 40 kilometers inland. Um, it was pretty swampy south of I-10 in Louisiana, um, and, you know, different people have different comfort levels on where they want to deploy, so kind of talk these things through and see what works for our team and where we think um, we get the best data, but also be safe. Yeah, we have, we have a lot of expertise. We also have very specialized equipment. Um, and uh, and we're particularly nimble um, and experienced. This is our 19th hurricane. Um, so we can make decisions that I would not be making if I were living at home with my family and pets. Um, so when the hurricane center says it's gonna be 15 or 20 foot surge across this area, you should leave and evacuate. Well, I would do that if I lived here with my family. But for us, we know that that 15 or 20 feet is only gonna occur in certain places depending on exactly where that storm is gonna come on shore. So we're particularly prepared and particularly nimble to be able to move from one place to another uh, at the last minute. Um, so we can make some decisions that you would not be able to make as easily if you're, if you're just living in that area. Um, but it's all just about a balance of uh, achieving our goals um, and staying safe. We want to be here for our 20th through 30th uh, hurricane, too. So we're not playing Russian roulette. It's, it's, it's not like one of these movies. Um, I know you watch a tornado chasing movie and they're sort of, well, we'll get this data, but we're risking our lives. No, we're not. You know, we're we're playing it very safe because the whole game of science is not just to get that one data set. It's to get repeated data sets over and over again. And you can't do that by taking outrageous chances. Um, and you just have to balance that. If, if you're not cautious and adventurous at all, you, you never get in that boat to discover the new continent. So there's a, there's a balance of... of of where to do that. A couple questions about um, various parameters about this particular storm influencing decision making. One is the large wind field, which has been talked about a lot. So, has that influenced your positioning decision making at all? And the other is um, obviously the potential for tornadic spin ups on one side of the storm, is that interest to you as well? And do either of those affect where you're positioning things? You're trying to go. <laughs> oh, good, I get all the, uh, 
You could talk about the large wind field, and I'll talk about tornadoes. Uh, yeah, sure. The large wind field um, is something that we've been talking about, we've been discussing. Also, we've been discussing the fast forward motion storm um, as well. So, the large wind field is, you know, obviously a concerning for surge, uh, for surge potential. How far out, you know, water's going to be pushed and pushed and pushed um, into these different locations. Places like bays, stuff like that, that don't have great outlets, there's a lot of push, push, push of that water. And maybe with the fast storm motion, that's a push of the water. Um, so we're not, you know, we don't actually have the answer to how we know that impacts that. But um, that's something we've been discussing, and again, really in particular with respect to storm surge, how that will affect, how that will affect bridge locations. Um, yeah, so for us, I mean, the large wind field has some good factors, too. It means we can still get some good data even a little further away or a broader area of good data. So that can be good for us. Again, we have very different goals than what somebody, you know, facing the storm as a threat is going to be. Um, but, you know, for us, achieving some of the science, a larger wind field could be good. Um, faster storm um, does mean it's stronger on the strong side. That part of the reason this is Cat 3 and Cat 4 is not just how strong the vortex is, but also it's moving very fast. Um, so what's not talked about a lot, and I understand why, but it's on the weak side of the storm. On the left side of the storm, these winds are going to be substantially weaker, and the storm surge will be substantially weaker on the west side of where this uh, of where the storm comes in. Now, of course, you don't know exactly where that's going to happen, so you can't count on that um, and say, hey, I'm not going to evacuate. I think I'm going to be on the west side, because if you're not, well, then you really chose wrong, and there's big consequences. In terms of tornadoes, um, we're certainly interested in tornadoes. Many times, we don't even deploy until one of these outer bands where most of the tornadoes are is already crossed. Um, but this time we deploy quite early and we're watching one of these bands that has um, mesocyclones in it um, coming towards us. And the terminology here is kind of difficult because we call those mesovortices, those big waves in the eye wall, mesovortices. Um, I try to call these things mesocyclones. Um, my battery is running low. Hold on. <laughs> Uh-oh. Found it. We're plugging something in as soon as I find a plug. There we go. Got a little better? Okay. Um, so, but this storm, we're watching this band come up that has a bunch of these mesovortices um, or mesocyclones. And uh, if it comes near us, we hope we can get some very interesting data with our two radars here. Um, it doesn't really affect our safety planning because there's not much we can do about it. We're not going to not deploy on an area because it might get a tornado. Um, we can't really run from it. So one of the big differences with hurricane chasing is once we make a decision to plant, um, and that decision is going to come up in probably 30 minutes, we're planted here for the duration. We're just going to take whatever comes towards us. So we need to make very careful decisions. We sit and discuss this for the last 36 hours. Karen and I have been looking at site after site after site. And in every one of them, there is a long discussion. And then we discuss it again about how good is this site going to be? What if this happens? What if that happens? What if a barge hits the bridge? What if a tornado vortex comes along and hits us when we're in this position or that position? So we're thinking about the safety, but we're also thinking about, well, if we're in that position, we're not inside the eye, so we're not achieving our goal as much as we wanted to. So how are we balancing those? Um, so it, it is a constant evolution process, a constant reevaluation process all through the day, all through the night. A lot of different questions all centered around access to data. Um, so two parts to the question. The first is, is the data you're collecting available in real time? And or if not, where and when will it be available? Lots of folks interested in accessing that. And the second part of it is, uh, is there any relation to the data that comes in from the ADAD radars um, and do they feed back and forth? Like, is there a connection to NOAA, et cetera? I was up to playing a poll. Do we have real-time data coming out? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so the way we've been doing it, sorry, it's not, it's not that we're not trying to. Um, we just have it set up for certain elevation scans where we start doing some weird scanning. Um, a lot of times that data doesn't get uploaded um, because what we had optimized for was sending sort of one elevation, you know, out to everybody. Um, so since this is sort of a last-minute deployment, um, we 
spend much time at all um, verifying that. So it'd be a surprise to everybody um, whether we're scanning at the right elevation, whether data's coming out to help it. <laughs> so I think that was a maybe. So we try to send real time data um, up to the public. Uh, we have a, a, a software system called Guru, and there's a website, and some people maybe on this call are, are familiar with that. Um, and you can get that real-time data um, as, as we upload it. So we will be trying to upload as much as we can. That's not our primary mission. Our primary mission is to get the data and then get it home, back it up three times, and then uh, start analyzing it. Sometimes it can take months or even years. Karen right now is working on the final touches of a publication, a scientific publication on Hurricane Laura from four years ago. So it takes a long time because we're also busy doing other things. Um, to analyze this data and turn it into scientific results. Um, so uh, eventually, once we get that data out and processed and quality controlled, um, it is usually available. We have FTP sites and that data can be requested. Uh, we have a website, HTTP colon slash slash, which you have to use because I haven't set it up right yet. That's that's on me. Um, this, this boomer doesn't know how to get rid of the HTTP. <laughs> Um, but uh, HTTP colon slash slash farmfacility.org. If you type that all in, farmfacility.org with the HTTP in front of it, um, you get to a page and there is a data request link or tab there and you can hit that and fill in a form and uh, we'll respond to you. And hopefully if the data is ready, we can get you the data. Sometimes it's slow. Um, oh. The second part of that question was about the ADAD, or you want to answer that first? Oh, no, go ahead. I'm saying, I think that poll that data, sorry, we were really scrambling a little bit. Um, the poll that Josh mentioned was on that data might be uploading to our farm facility website, farmfacility.org, all those things in front. Um, so you might be able to see the poll data in real time. Oh, okay. I haven't seen that yet. Yeah. So, um, but I, yeah, I heard uh, Josh was saying that yeah. the data's coming up. So we have this anemometer out there. Right now, it's probably saying 30 miles an hour, really exciting. But maybe when the storm gets closer, that will be more interesting. Um, and in the question of how this is, what's different than the AD, so it's all radars. Somebody asked about how does this relate to the ADAT. We're all weather radars. Um, the difference with the Dow is just that we're up close and we're right here at ground zero. The nearest ADAT is up in somewhere near Tallahassee. So it's dozens and dozens of miles away. Um, and it's collecting you know, broad area surveillance. That's its mission. Our mission is to look at this teeny little area. You saw those little area of the hurricane that uh, Karen's doing this analysis on in Hurricane Laura. So the ADAD saw the whole storm um, of, of Hurricane Laura until it broke. Um, and we were able to see just this little piece, but we got much better data in that little piece. So it's a very different mission. And we use both kinds of data in our analysis. Um, and. I'm not sure what the rest of the question about how is the data merged, but we use the data in our analysis sometimes. Um, and we certainly share it out to other researchers and then forecasters learn what we've learned about the hurricanes and the boundary layer roles. And the modelers now know that some of this mixing is different than some of the numbers that they used to have in the models. So we're hoping that some of the data we collect feeds back into better models, better forecasts. There's tons of discussion about how fast is Helene going to intensify and why wasn't it intensifying earlier? And, you know, is it going to keep intensifying or is it going to be intermittent process? Well, all of that is based on how well it's taking advantage of that energy in the ocean. The ocean's full of all this energy, right? It's very warm ocean temperatures. And whether the storm is efficiently using that to intensify is, I mean, that's the name of the game here. And understanding these boundary layer structures is a critical part of, of, of making better predictions about which storms are going to intensify and when? And then even harder questions. What are the sizes of storms going to be? I mean, is it going to have a big wind field or a small wind field? Is one side going to be weaker or, or stronger? We, used to, we A lot of storms have one side of the storm that's very weak, and we don't know why, and we don't know how to predict that. So there's a lot of questions we don't know the answers to very precisely. Related note. Dif what are the primary differences in the types of data you're collecting with a DAO versus, for example, what hurricane hunters might be collecting high above you? Well, yeah, I mean, I'll just I'll put the answer to that to you. Yeah, I mean, hurricane hunters obviously are very focused on um, operations. Um, so really getting in the operational data, really getting the real-time position, the real-time winds at flight level pressure drops, 
um, and getting this information then into models. The state is getting assimilated into models and you know, projecting forward. So very focused on operational data, not that you know, there's not research aspects of that too, but very immediately operational. And also, how about the quiet hurricane hunters, the ones that are in the G4 flying around the hurricane? They're not doing the cool thing, penetrating into the hurricane, but they're sampling the environment, which is, of course, what's driving that hurricane, which direction it's going to go. So um, equally, maybe even more important for these hurricane models is to know the environment around. Um, but yeah, the hurricane uh, hunters are focused on where is that hurricane going to go today? How should we adjust this warning so that different people evacuate or don't evacuate? It's a very much what's going to happen today, what's going to happen tomorrow kind of mission. What we're doing is trying to, as a scientific process, we're studying this boundary layer. We're trying to study the fundamentals of what are happening in these hurricanes so that next year's or three years from now's forecasts about intensification or about track or about size uh, or about what kinds of damage will happen will be improved. So we're kind of looking at the bigger, longer picture um, and we're research oriented, not operationally. You know, what's tomorrow's forecast oriented? Um, quick, quick operational Dow question. Does your team stay with the Dows during the hurricane or do you head back to a hotel, like a warm, comfortable hotel? Please go back to a warm, comfortable hotel. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to go back to a warm, comfortable hotel, but no. So my, my night, Karen's night, everybody on the team here will be spent in these hot, smelly, humid, noisy, what are they? That cramps and cramps. Oh, leaky because it's a hurricane. Yeah. Um, 100 mile an hour winds, somehow water finds a way to get in, no matter how tightly we've sealed everything. Uh, no, we, we basically sit with our instruments. We sit, we sit in the Dows. Um, it's pretty unpleasant. It's probably interesting for an hour. Um, but there's 10 hours of it of just monitoring the instruments, keeping things going. Um, this one's going to be at night, so we're mainly going to be looking out of our headlights and watching raindrops go by really fast. I'm not describing that in a really favorable way. So come out. Sounds like a sounds like a good time. Sign me up. <laughs> the, the hurricane missions are, are quite miserable. Um, I mean, they're really interesting. We're getting fascinating data. I mean, it's just, it's great. So I mean, I. I really like what I do. It's a lot of fun overall. The particular 24 hours in the hurricane is, is difficult. It's it's it, it's pretty miserable. You can see, I don't know, we're probably looking like we're all sweaty here. Um, it, you know, it's hot and humid and kind of gross, and you almost can't keep things cool. Um, there's no bathrooms. I forgot to mention that. Yeah, so, you know, it's it's got it all going for it. You can't go outside during the hurricane, you know, to, if, if you need uh, a need of biology either, so... Um, it's got a lot of things going for it. I mean, you could. I don't know that it would like end well necessarily. Well, or it might not end well because well <laughs> with the 110 mile an hour winds, it might you know blow you off the truck steps onto the ground or something. We pretty much don't let people go out during the eye wall just because it's has a hazardous level of wind, and that's particularly true if we're in a very exposed location up on a bridge or something like that. The winds in some of the locations we deploy on and out on a bridge or on top of a levee can be 20, 30 percent stronger than you might be experiencing other places. Um, even if you see hurricane chasers or weather channel people standing up there again, you know, we're probably getting 20 or 30 percent more wind than those people are. Um, and it's it, it's actually getting to a dangerous thing. I mean, there's no way we stand up outside, do anything. We'd be blown flat sometimes. What would you say, uh, let's go back to a, a radar data question. What would you say uh, you've observed to be the difference between mesocyclones in the outer bands of a hurricane and non-tropical mesocyclones or the parts that are interesting to you about that? Supercells? Yeah. I mean, like mesocyclones not related to hurricanes. <laughs> right. So see, mesocyclone type things. I think you're talking about these sort of low topped or sort of mini supercells you see in hurricanes. I mean, yeah. they're, they're sort of a different flavor of a typical high plains type or southeastern supercell. Um, so they're, they're smaller. They're, um, they're lower, lower topped. 
um, some of the physics is pretty similar. I mean, you've got shear and, and buoyancy. So some of the main physics of why you have a supersonic rotation is similar. Um, one of the key things about them is they're just moving pretty fast. Um, so I, I don't know how fast these guys are moving, but I don't know, 50, 60 miles an hour, they're just zipping around the storm there. Um, and, uh, and of course they're impacting an area which usually, you know, right ahead of time where it's going to get impacted by much really bad winds soon. So it's just sort of adding yet another way of, uh, of causing impact, causing damage. What happens after the hurricane? So you talked about your time in the Dow while the main portion of the hurricane passes. Do you, have you found that maybe you get stuck? Do you then go and take damage observations? Is there an interaction with first responders or a reporting mechanism? What happens afterward? We get stuck sometimes. <laughs> so our... What we try to do after the hurricane is get out as quickly as possible. Um, so if, usually we don't have a lot of help with first responders. There's a lot of first responders around. Generally, there's been a, these emergency management centers are all set up for that. Um, they really have a lot of people, a lot of people who are trained, a lot of people who are supervised to, to help with a lot of this. Um, I know it, it, it's tempting a lot of times for to, to want to help, um, but uh, sometimes it's not as much help as you might think, even though you kind of want to help where you see something. Um, generally, it's better to let the people who are trained and supervised and have this whole structure um, to leave that really in their hands. Um, so what we mainly are trying to do is not be a burden to the system. Um, so we try to get out very, very quickly. We try to get out before um, a lot of people are even out of shelters and doing things like that. Um, probably not so much in this storm because it's hitting a pretty low density, low population density area. But we've been in storms that have hit high density, high population density areas of Florida, of, um, of Texas, like in Galveston, we were downtown Galveston for a hurricane. Um, and it's really tough. There are thousands of people left, you know, about a third of people don't evacuate. Um, so you have thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of people who then have no infrastructure. So um, I strongly advise people to evacuate for two reasons. One, there's this immediate hazard um, of the winds and surge. And people say, well, I've solved that. My house is really strong or I'm on the third floor. And sure, I think some people, from speaking rationally, have probably mitigated the direct risk from the few hours of hurricane. They probably are in a third floor and they're in some concrete bunker house and they're going to survive. Um, but what they haven't mitigated is that they're not going to have power or water or sewage or you know fresh food or anything for one week, two weeks, sometimes three weeks. Um, and it's going to be a pretty difficult place to live. No air conditioning and it's hot and humid. Um, it's, it's a pretty rotten place uh, after a major hurricane. So... Um, for most people, it's better to get out of there, try to find a shelter where you can stay for a while with your pets, with your kids, whatever. Um, if you can afford it, get far enough away so that you can have a hotel that you can be in one, two or three weeks. Um, it's a difficult choice to do that. But the misery after the hurricane, um, even if you solve the problem of the immediate risk of dying in the hurricane, the misery afterwards is, is pretty bad. And you're just a big burden because there are people who need rescuing. There are people who are really sick and infirm and, and, and need help. And if you're adding to that burden of all these first responders and later responders and, and infrastructure, um, you know, why do that? You're, you're a better person, a better citizen by getting out of there and, and letting the system focus on the, on the recovery. Few questions. Questions of, around mitigating the risks of storm surge. So how do you balance wanting to be as close as you can get with recognizing the risks of storm surge and where does that kind of position you most times, at least to date? So we have very detailed maps. We have all these detailed, uh, you know, USGS and other kind of maps that show 
what the altitudes are. So, so we know how high things are. Uh, we carry big, thick tape measures, and we were measuring the heights of bridges because we don't trust it unless we really measured it. Um, you know, things of that sort. Um, we have a pretty good idea. There's different kinds of surge models, and some of them can be pretty precise, um, knowing the speed and direction of a, a, an intensity of a, of a hurricane and where exactly it's going to make landfall, whether it's east of you or west of you, what the surge is going to be in those different areas. So we have some pretty good information there. Um, there's still a bunch of uncertainty. I mean, even if we plan it perfectly, well, the forecast might be off by 10 miles or 20 miles, and then all of a sudden we're on the strong side of the storm, and we thought we were going to be in the weak side of the storm. Or what if all of a sudden the storm intensifies and it's a whole category stronger than what was forecast? So we build that into our caution plan. So this bridge, this 20-foot bridge we're talking about, um, well, the surge over there is probably going to be 10 feet. It's probably going to be fine. Well, what if it's our forecast is wrong? What if it's 15 feet? Well, then we're probably still fine. But we want to make sure we're not deploying on something where if if we make a mistake, if the forecasts are wrong, um, that we really are at risk of, of getting hit by surge. We've we've done this for 19 hurricanes. We've deployed probably 35 different Dow locations and all sorts of different pods. We've never been seriously impacted by surge. I think we had a little few inches of surge on us once, and we kind of knew that was going to happen. Um, we've had some situations where the surge has been under forecast, and we've been worried because we're stuck there, and the surge is coming up, and it was supposed to be six feet, and we're at 16 feet. So we're initially thinking, hey, six feet, 16 feet, we're in great shape. Well, the water kept coming up and coming up and coming up, and it got to around 13 or 14 feet, and we were quite nervous. Um, but still, we were out of it. We had a factor of two safety margin, and we used most of it. Um, and that's that's the worst case. That's a very rare case. Um, so we're just trying to balance not being too cautious because, like I said, you'd never get on the boat. You'd never get in the spacecraft and go to the moon. If you're too cautious, you never do those things. Um, but if you're reckless, it's not too soon to talk about submersibles. But if you're, you know, but you can obviously take risks that are now different I said, issue. <laughs> you can take, um, you can take risks that might be unwise. And they, and certainly we see situations um, where people are taking risks, which maybe are are too much. Uh, and, you know, you're, they're hiking unprepared into the wilderness. You know, well, we try not to hike unprepared into this wilderness. We are extremely well prepared. Uh, we have a lot of group discussions. Um, so it's not one person just going off on what he's hoping is going to be true. You know, I hope that storm ends. I hope that surge isn't as bad. We, we try to have consensus decisions there. Um, and so far it's worked. I mean, we've, we've been safe all, all the time because we've been taking this approach. Simultaneously, we've got the most groundbreaking data of any scientific group that's out here doing this type of mission because we also are, are you know, we sort of know where the edge of the cliff is and we, we stay a foot or two back from it, but we don't stay a mile back from the cliff. We stay a few feet back from it. Got it. So related question, and I'm going to broaden this a little bit because I know it's been a hot topic. A couple questions about whether your data is fed into determining kind of rankings of ultimate strength of various hurricanes. And I'm going to broaden this to whether your data is also used for things like determining an EF ranking for a tornado. Um, right on the on the current scale such as it is and what is the utility of that versus the types of things that you're actually focusing on in your research ratings of hurricanes and tornadoes are two completely different creatures and they're done differently and there's different procedures and all sorts of things like that so hurricanes are rated in real time um, by the Hurricane Center, and they're taking satellite data, they're taking these Hurricane Hunter data, they're using buoy data, or ship data, any kind of data they get, and they're updating the, the ranking based on a broad, whatever spectrum of data they have. Um, a lot of times it's just a satellite because it's way out in the ocean, but when they get into the Caribbean, as they get closer to land, there's, you know, there's a diversity of data, and the Hurricane Center basically absorbs all of that data to make its rankings. In addition, 
the Hurricane Center will revise its rankings based on data that comes in later. So if somebody from one of these research teams like ours or Texas Tech or University of Florida, if they have some anemometers, and we've seen those other teams out there putting up these anemometers, that's why I mentioned them, and uh, they'll report in their wind data and the Hurricane Center will use that data to update and refine um, the ranking of the intensity of, of that hurricane. Um, now, you know, can't one, two, three, or four of those are just arbitrary lines there, but they might change what they think the surface maximum surface wind fields were. Maybe they'll say this was 125 or 135 or something like that based on later data, based on the, the wealth of data that's available. Tornado rankings officially are done using the enhanced Fujita scale. That is only using one type of data. That's a policy decision by the National Weather Service. So talk to them about whether that's wise or not, but they use one type of data that is damage surveys. That's it. You can have an anemometer in the middle of a tornado measuring X miles per hour. It doesn't affect the EF rating. The only thing that affects the EF rating is that tipped over building. Doesn't matter what the anemometer measured, doesn't matter what the radar measured, nothing matters but the damage. That's the way it is right now, and that's the official way of doing it. Now, scientists, we rank tornadoes based on any kind of measurements we can get. So if there's damage, if there's an anemometer, if there's a radar, we'll use it all because we think that's the best answer. It's more similar to what the Hurricane Center does. We kind of use it all. Um, so if we have a radar and we have a pod, or if there was a building knocked over, we'll put that all into the mix and come up with what we think the best wind, you know, the most accurate wind speed was. Now, there is an effort, there is a concentrated effort going on right now. Um, it's uh, under the rubric that we're under the sponsorship of the uh, American Society of Civil Engineers. Karen and I are both on this big committee, it's 50 people on this committee um, who are trying to come up with a official, peer-reviewed, really good, repeatable, rigorous standard where all that data can go in to ranking a tornado, where damage and tree fall and satellite evidence, you know, you see a swath of damage from satellite. Well, that can't be used by the Weather Service, but we're going to have a, a standard there where you could use radar, anemometry, tree fall data, satellite data, damage, of course, and that's, that's how a lot of tornadoes are still going to be ranked. Um, but you'll be able to use that more holistically, an overused word, to come up with the best estimate of what the wind speed is in that tornado. A very long answer there, but. Relevant right now, especially. Um, all right, so uh, I know we need to wrap up so Gideon can say some final words. Um, any last thoughts or anything you want to make sure you share about this particular mission um, that we haven't discussed? Karen's telling me because she's been distracted here in the last couple questions. That's why I've been doing all the talking. Well, that's only one of the reasons I've been doing all the talking. But <laughs> this is this is enhanced, <laughs> enabled my talking. Um, that the Hurricane Center has come out with its 5 p.m. forecast and it looks like the track has shifted a little east, so we might be in a good position. It looks like probably our last minute decision is to not move. So uh, as soon as we're as soon as we're done this, we're going to run out and start deploying our pods and getting ready for this line of what looked like little shallow supercells. You can see them on the 88D. Um, hopefully, if they come in shore, we'll see those in a lot more detail. So that'd be pretty exciting. So we're going to get ready cool. for the real meat of our mission starting in a few minutes uh, through midnight or 2 a.m. Okay, well, wishing you both a successful and safe mission um, and that you don't get stuck for too long afterward. Thank you very much for your service in this area, making a difference um, to scientific research and for sitting in a hot, smelly Dow for <laughs> whatever extended period of time that requires. Um, Gideon, yeah, yeah. I will hand it back over to you to wrap up right on time here. Uh